Well, the severity of global food insecurity is worse than ever, according to a new report from the World Food Program that identifies 18 hotspots on the brink of catastrophic hunger. And this isn't just a problem in countries facing war, famine and climate disasters. In the United States alone, nearly a third of college students struggle with food insecurity. Chef and humanitarian activist Jose Andres is on the front lines of the global food crisis. He joined Hari Srinivasan to discuss his new plans to tackle it all. Biana, thanks. Chef Jose Andres, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, you have been addressing and tackling the problems of food insecurity for so long now, and you are now launching a new Global Food Institute partnered with George Washington uh, University. Why? What is this going to do? Well, uh, let me tell you why the idea of a Global Food Institute right in Washington, D.C., at George Washington University. That happens is one of the universities in America that addresses politics and food policy like no other university. So close to Washington, D.C. power, White House, and the Capitol. Today, we see a world in the United States and countries everywhere where food seems is always an afterthought, where the different departments of agriculture almost seem sometimes they are run to see food as a commodity, where often is not solving the issues that people face. Today, planet Earth produces enough food to feed all of humanity two, three times, but still we have hundreds of millions of people that go to bed hungry. We need to start creating a smarter policy, a smarter bills that becomes good politics in bipartisan ways. We need to start considering food as a national security issue. And we need to start thinking that the presidents of every country will have a national food security advisor. Why? Because time is precious. We have right now climate change that is affecting crops every country around the world. We have droughts at the same time. We have plagues that right now are attacking entire countries in the heart of Africa. We have wars. We have mass migrations happening. If we don't start taking food more seriously, I'm afraid that we're gonna be very close to one of the biggest mass migrations in the history of mankind. And that today we feel food, it's available to all of us. One day we may wake up one day and we're actually, actually it's not enough food to feed everybody. That's why we need to create this Global Food Institute to start putting more importance into the word food. Every politician running for president, for governor, for senator or congressman in America around the world is gonna have to have, what is their food uh, policy? How are they gonna be thinking about food in the way they do politics? That's what we hope to achieve at this institute. So is the Institute responsible for kind of primary research? Are you going to try to make kind of practical suggestions? Is there going to be the equivalent of like a, a training camp for uh, food policy activists from the world to come and, and, and watch or participate in? I will say, obviously, you need to start small and, uh, uh, and keep building uh, bigger. But I will say it's all of the above. Uh, right now in the United States, we have more than 40 departments and offices running over 200 food programs. They don't even speak one with each other. What we're gonna be trying to do is one very simple thing. I believe that we put food in the middle of the table, like I've been doing already for over 10 years with this class that we've done at George Washington where we've been testing the waters. And all of a sudden you realize that food is immigration. Food is climate change and is the environment. Food, in many ways, is the Department of Defense. Remember that the school lunch program in the United States of America was launched in 1946 at the request of the Department of Defense and the Pentagon. Why? Because it was one moment that the uh, Pentagon couldn't fulfill all the needs of the Army because all the young men and women joining the military were, were unfit to serve because they were hungry, because they were coming from very poor areas. Right now, we see the completely opposite. Right now, we see that the military is having issues fulfilling their needs because many other issues like obesity, et cetera. 
if we start thinking food is very much everything, even the way we do humanitarian aid in the rich countries, cannot be that the way rich countries do humanitarian aid, it's sending their surplus of food to solve the food uh, problems. Why? We saw it in Haiti after the earthquake. We sent so much food for free that we put all the farmers in Haiti out of business. When now 14 years later, you see farmers knocking on the door of trying to come to America, everything is, con everything is connected. The way we do humanitarian aid is what also makes poor countries poorer. In the process, we have people migrating because they don't have a way to feed their families. We need to start having uh, an entire government that where the different departments speak more to each other the Department of Health, the Department of Agriculture, the Department of Infrastructure with Homeland Security. We need to start having a more kind of interaction when we put food in the middle about every single department. Or all work together, uh, or, or we will have many problems. If we make them work together, we can be solving many of the issues we are facing right now. You know, most people, if they have seen you over the past few years, they think of you and food in the context of crises. And we'll talk about that a little bit. But there are lots of other ways where it's not just in the context of uh, a war or an immediate famine or an earthquake that people are suffering food insecurity, even here in the United States. It's really, uh, we have a tendency to think like what's happening in Haiti has nothing to do with what's what's happening in Ohio. And at the end, if you start thinking, it's all about distribution. Every, if we have enough food in the planet, but we have people hungry, uh, you will agree with me that it's about distribution. We've seen what's happening the last week in Washington, that you see Republicans and Democrats, they've been negotiating about uh, increasing the debt. And one of the names uh, of the issues they've been uh, talking all the time has been about the SNAPs. Do we cut the SNAPs? What, we call uh, in, in, in more practical terms, food stamps, which is a supplement that is given to American families that may have uh, a, a, a difficult time putting food on, on the table. The way we are doing the stamps right now shouldn't be about if we cut it or not, but the conversation by Republicans and Democrats should be about how do we improve it? Very much is SNAPs is an old program that has proven very effective, but that has in a way not modernized itself. Why we don't make sure that we increase the SNAPs, but to buy fresh fruits and vegetables from uh, uh, different farmers in rural areas, that in the process of keeping those families uh, 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 fed, we help the local rural economies in the process of solving the problem of hunger in American families, we increase the output of federal money that goes to be invested in rural areas. All of a sudden we solve the problem, but in the process, we help rural economies that sometimes they fall behind do better. Why well, we cannot use the SNAPs in local restaurants or diners? Why the people that receive the SNAPs benefits that usually they live in some of the poor communities in the cities in America cannot be spending that money in the same community they live? They yeah. usually have to go so other community because in the communities they live, sometimes they are so poor that there is no restaurant, there is no supermarkets, Let's make sure that in the process of helping the American families, we don't throw money at the problem, but in the process, we encourage economic growth by opening diners, opening food trucks, creating jobs in those poor communities, opening uh, markets that sell actually fresh fruits and vegetables. You see, if we have a smarter policy, a smarter bills, all of a sudden we start solving problems one at a time. Chef, speaking of hunger here at home, based on a survey back in 2020 by Temple University, about 30% of students at four-year colleges and 40% of students at two-year colleges are facing food insecurity today. So I'm wondering whether that's something that you're going to be studying uh, at the Food Institute at George Washington. I'm a big believer in, in working both hands. You have to make sure that the big thinking happens in the places of power and you achieve this through good policy and good bills, but then you may need to make sure that all these filters down all the way to every single situation and every single uh, community. So yes, places like yours, Washington, some of the richest of, uh, universities in America where the tuition can be very expensive. We, we hear all over every time that these many students, as you mentioned, that they're having a hard time of putting 
uh, foot on the table. Obviously, uh, George Washington, uh, as I'm, I'm, uh, let's say I'm a new faculty member now, and I will be even more involved in the universities. We will make sure that, if anything, George Washington becomes one of these uh, of, of universities that is a uh, 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 part uh, of the solution uh, and not part of the problem. But listen, it's like in Washington, D.C., this is Central Kitchen. I was 26, 27 years old when President Clinton came to visit. I saw in first person a hunger caucus where senators of both parties left the hill and came to that soup kitchen where an entire homeless shelter was right above to do this kind of a smart conversation about how to solve hunger issues. So I'm a big believer that yes, policymakers, they need to be thinking big, but they need to be doing so at the street level where the problems are. Uh, hunger and poverty is not an issue of Republicans or Democrats. It's an issue of Americans. It's a problem, not a problem for us to solve, but an opportunity for us to seize. Again, that's the reason of the Global Food Institute. That's what we have big dreams, but obviously you need to start one plate of food at a time, one smart policy at a time, but I hope slowly but surely we will be able to bring everybody to this longer table where the right ideas that are happening right now in every point in America, in many places in America, many places around the world, that we give voice to those ideas and one idea at a time will become a smart policy that hopefully will help America and the world be better in relationship to the way we produce and we feed the world. The UN World Food Program said recently they put out a report, 18 hotspots across 22 different countries. And it said basically millions of people are currently in or on the brink of, quote, catastrophic conditions in which starvation, death, destitution, and extremely critical acute malnutrition levels are evident. So what are some of the consequences of that? And how do you intercede? How do you, uh, in the kind of immediate regions of crisis, uh, get food into places that other aid agencies have a tough time getting into? Uh, well, uh, obviously, uh, in my case, uh, World Central Kitchen, we, we've been more based around the idea in natural disasters and showing up in the very short term, early days, hours, days, and weeks to make sure that we cover the short term need uh, in a disaster of food into the communities. Uh, obviously, is 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 many agencies around the world. Uh, obviously, the biggest one uh, being uh, World Food Program who they've been doing uh, uh, an amazing job uh, over the years, always with room to improve, but an amazing job uh, over the years. But here you, you are in this kind of, of moment of where we are having uh, many uh, issues that they seem they are very localized, but they are having a huge impact uh, regionally or even worldwide. What's happening in Ukraine in a way uh, is a country defending themselves from this massive attack by, by Russians, an unfair attack killing civilians mainly every single day with uh, uh, bombs. But in the process, we are realizing that that war is not only for uh, their people and their freedom. Ukraine, with the grain is produced in those fertile lands of, of that country, feeds roughly between 450 and, 450 and 500 million people every year. That's why you see this uh, grain deal to try to make sure that the Russians allow the grain exports to continue. Uh, without that grain, we are going to be seeing bigger hunger issues in many countries in the world, in Africa. And this is a conversation. But the bigger conversation is why African countries still depend from that Ukrainian grain to feed themselves. Why, why after so many years of talking that we need to make sure that Africa is a continent that can feed itself? Why still we're talking about shipping grain to feed those uh, Africans? The short term to solve the hunger issues, yes, will be the war to end or hopefully the grain to keep flowing from Ukraine to Africa. But the bigger picture is why once and for all, the African nations with the help of richer countries around the world has not helped to have a stronger uh, farming uh, production that itself, Africa, can be feeding itself. These are kind of the long-term uh, solutions that they are not gonna be resolved in one day. And they're not going to be resolved by, by one bill or by uh, a UN program overnight. We need to start investing right now. 
Chef, for people who might not be familiar, uh, how do you get aid into a place after a natural disaster so quickly? How are you able to scale up, uh, whether it's Haiti or Turkey? I mean, how, how does the World Central Kitchen do it? What's your model? So again, I want to say we, we are not the only uh, uh, food relief organization. There's many great people doing God's work in many parts of the world. But um, very often, uh, especially uh, since we were founded, uh, I founded it over 13, 14 years ago. And especially, I will say, right after Maria, that is when we had the very big uh, growth. Uh, I said before, big problems have very simple solutions. And everybody always asks me, Jose, where do you guys get the food? I'm like, in the food warehouses and in the supermarkets. They are there. They may not answer the phone, but, but the food is there. What we do is fairly practical. Um, when you have to stop a fire, who do you send? You send firefighters. When you have to take care of the wounded, uh, who you send? Nurses and doctors. When you need to be feeding people, who do you send? Well, you send cooks huh, uh, uh, and people that think uh, like cooks. Even Borsen Dragician is an organization that is a big team of people that are beyond cooks. But obviously, to feed, you have to cook. What do you do? You find restaurants, restaurants that survive the hurricane or restaurants that survive the earthquake, and they are strategically located. I don't need to build a field kitchen if I don't have to, if I have restaurants that are available. So let's use the assets that they have in place. If we activate food trucks because they're available, they happen in Florida and Fort Myers, we may be activating 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. Uh, if we don't have a kitchen, like happened in Bahamas in Abaco, because the entire island was underwater. There, we bring it initially by helicopter or by boat to every island. We did more than 80,000 meals a day in the early weeks until we built a field kitchen in Abaco when the situation improves. You see, we adapt. And uh, usually, it's always local people that want to help. Usually, it's always local assets and restaurants and food trucks that we can activate immediately. And usually, it's always warehouses full of food and if not, we bring it with us. In the case of a hurricane, we can pre, pre, uh, look, uh, pre dispose uh, food trucks all across with food and refrigerators, uh, generators to get everything running. Uh, again, the only thing we do is that we show up and do it. Uh, we don't. We always say we don't like to meet too much. What we like is to start cooking, going in the field, and start looking for one community at a time. In the process, you keep increasing the output every day. Very much that's how World Central Kitchen has been doing it from day one. Chef Jose Andres, uh, founder of the Global Food Institute at George Washington, as well as the founder of the World Central Kitchen. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me.